Welcome to That Was Then. For 35 years, God has blessed us to share together as pastor and people on the grow. This series highlights our time together by featuring one message from each seven-year period. The times, issues, and challenges were different, but the faithfulness of God never changed. May you be encouraged and challenged as you share this series of messages. And I want to speak to you today from the subject with the aid and assistance and anointing of the Holy Spirit. I want to teach and preach about deepen your discipline. Look at your neighbor and say, deepen your discipline. Deepen your discipline. Amen. In the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, the text says every athlete exercises self-discipline. They do it to win an award, a reef, a perishable uh, prize, but we exercise self-discipline to win an eternal award. Every great achiever shares one common denominator, a growing sense of personal discipline. Paul was an extremely disciplined person. He had tremendous self-control. And that's the target of the talk in the text for today. Paul says to you and I, I want to be a success. I'm running not just to compete, but I'm running to win. I'm in it to win it. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm in it to win it. See, and I want to tell you very quickly in no unequivocal terms that discipline is the key to personal achievement. It's not easy, but it's effective. Discipline is not a popular subject in our culture today. For practical principles of prayer, perseverance, productivity, and patience have fallen into disrepute. Our personal and our public lives are plagued by the personal pursuit of pleasure. Don't think about it. Don't contemplate the outcome. Don't look at the long-term consequences. If it feels good, do it. If it doesn't feel good, dump it. Tragically, in our time, our focus is fixed solely on what's fun. If it's fun, find it. If it's not fun, forget it. Anything that is unpleasant should be avoided at all costs. We do not like in this time good old-fashioned discipline. Amen. Give me a better amen. amen. In a recent Milo and Otis cartoon, Milo and Otis are having a conversation. Milo says, you rang Kimo Sambi? Otis says, Milo, I'd like to hire you as my diet and exercise coach. Milo said, fine, let's try eating less and exercising more. Otis says, no, 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 for goodness sake. I'm a typically overweight American, and I'd like a diet and exercise plan that allows me to eat what I want as much as I want whenever I want. Milo says, well, great. That means you're going to have to get your stomach surgically reduced. You're going to be hospitalized for several days, take you a couple of weeks to a couple of months in order to recover. Otis says, no. No, I don't want anything that drastic. I just want to eat what I want to and not gain any weight ever. And everybody who can identify with that sentiment said, amen. <laughs> Give me any other medication except a strong dose of discipline. Ours is a day that desires wealth without work, success without sacrifice, beautiful bodies without exercise, Spirituality without struggle, po power without prayer, friendship without fellowship, roses without rain, blessings without burdens, and a crown without cross. And yet the scriptures teach us in many, many different ways that discipline is the key to personal achievement. There will be divine interruptions. There will be divine interventions. There will be miraculous serendipities. But by and large, during this incredible odyssey that we call our lives, your blessing and my blessing, your miracle and my miracle, your deliverance and my deliverance will come on the tail end of some perfected discipline that we have met and mastered. If I pray for strong teeth, when I get up off my knees, I've got to practice the discipline of brushing, flossing, and eliminating sugar from my diet. 
If I pray for weight loss, when I get up off my knees, I've got to practice the discipline of pushing away from the table and saying no to the dessert and trying to eat more fiber and exercise more regularly. If I pray for a better financial situation, when I get off my knees, I got to get a job. I got to go to work. I got to build a budget. I've got to live within my means, pay my tithe, and discipline all of my desires. One song, one poem writer rather wrote these words, I asked God for strength and God gave me a struggle to make me strong. I asked God for wisdom and God gave me complex problems to solve. I asked God for prosperity and God gave me brawn and brain to work. I asked God for courage and God put danger in my life that I had to face and overcome. I asked God for love and God gave me trouble, confused, mixed up friends that I had to help. I asked God for favors and God gave me open opportunity. I received nothing I asked for, but everything I hoped for, I am truly wonderfully blessed. What's the point, preacher? That discipline is the key to personal achievement. And so today, in this 11th lesson, as we get ready for Century 21, I want us to take a look at what the Bible says about personal discipline, and then I want to try, with the assistance of the Holy Spirit, to offer to us a plan for deepening the level of discipline in our lives based on the Word of God. Anybody here interested in this message today? If you're interested, just say to me, bring it on, preacher. Oh, y'all really interested. Amen. Uh, praise God. Well, look, first, the scriptures teach us that personal discipline, that self-control must be a priority. Say that with me, priority. And while there are multiple areas where discipline must be a priority, I want to plot six practices on the paint canvas of your heart. If you want to know and live and enjoy a successful life, a faithful life, a godly life, a spiritual life, a productive life, you're going to have to meet and master at least these six areas. And you can use the outline today in your bulletin as a checklist to evaluate your own life and experience in order to make personal personal discipline a priority in my life, the first thing that I must do is I must master my moods. Tell your neighbor, say, I think this one's for you today. <laughs> See, successful people are simply people who are willing to do what unsuccessful people are not willing to do. They're no different, they're no better, they're just willing to go the extra mile. See, one of the first disciplines we must meet and master in our efforts to get ready for Century 21 and the rest of our lives is to get a handle on our feelings, to master our mood. So let me raise the question, are you a moody person? Do you live, amen, I think I got a witness in the house. Uh, do you live by your emotions? What percent of your decisions would you say you've made because I felt like it? Based on your moods. I didn't feel like it, so I didn't do it. I felt like it, so I did it. We must master our moods. Well, how do you know, preacher? Proverbs 25, 28 in the Living Bible says, A man or a woman without self-control is as defenseless as a city with broken down walls. Got to master your moods. Look at your neighbor. Say, master your mood. Master your mood. Now, now, just smile and say, I don't care if you don't feel like it. I'm going to talk to you anyway. Amen. <laughs> Uh, amen. You got you. You got to master your moods. Uh, one Sunday, this mother went in to wake up her son, saying, "Son, get up. You got to get ready to go to church." He turned over and see. He said, "Ma, I'm not going. I don't feel like it." She said, "You better get up, boy. You're gonna be late." He said, "But ma, I really don't feel like going. I'm not going down to that church because I don't like the people down at that church and they don't like me." And uh, the mother said, "But son, you got to get up anyway. You're going to run late. You're going to church anyway." And he said, "Well, give me one good reason why I ought to go." She said, "Well, I'm gonna give you two good reasons." She said, "Number one, you're 53 years old. Number two, you." the pastor of the church. <laughs> but can you identify with that? Uh, have you met something this past week that you really needed to do, but you didn't feel like doing? Look at your neighbor and say, he barking up your tree again. 
See, we will never become successful by solely doing what we feel. Most of the great things in life are done by people who didn't feel like doing them. Discipline is doing what you will, not what you feel. Wake up and write that down. The scriptures teach us that a person who has no self-control is defenseless. Without discipline, we are at the mercy of our moods. We're at their whim. I feel like it. I don't feel like it. We are helpless. We are a victim of emotion. To deepen our discipline and achieve our greatest potential, we must first work to master our moods. But secondly, I must watch my words. Tell your neighbor, say, watch your words. Come on, three times. Just say, watch your words, watch your words, watch your words. <laughs> a amen. Look, Proverbs 13, 3 says, he who guards his lips guards his life. But he who speaks rashly will come to ruin. You can say the wrong thing at the wrong time and get yourself into deep trouble. <laughs> Proverbs 21, 23 in the Living Bible says, keep your mouth shut and you'll stay out of trouble. James 1.26 says, if you don't know how to tame your tongue, then your religion is worthless. If I'm going to deepen my discipline, I've got to master my moods, and then I've got to work to watch my words. One writer said, the mouth is the grocer's friend, the dentist's fortune, the orator's pride, and the fool's trap. Y'all get that on the way home, okay. I can't tell you how many people have been hung by the tongue, crucified by the very words that they have spoken. A hot-headed woman once approached Pastor John Wesley and said, Pastor, my talent is to speak my mind, and I'm going to exercise my talent. The pastor says, Sister, that's one talent that God wouldn't mind if you bury. If we would deepen our discipline, we must watch our words. And we might as well be honest with each other that that whole business of watching what you say is hard to do. Amen? Be honest. Ain't it hard not to gossip? I mean, you know, can we talk? One, one writer said, some secrets are worth keeping, others are too good to keep. R.G. <laughs> L. R. G. Letourney, owner of a large earth-moving equipment company, told a story about a scraper that he had on his yard that was known as the Big G. Somebody asked one of the salesmen what the Big G stood for, and the salesman said it stands for gossip, because like gossip, that machine can move a whole lot of dirt and do it real quick. See, an unrestrained tongue is a sign of immaturity. We've got to work to watch our words, to discipline our speech, work at it. If you can't say anything good, don't say anything at all. Amen. Third step to deepening our discipline is I must restrain my reactions. Proverbs 19.11 in the Good News Bible says, If you are sensible, you will control your temper. When someone wrongs you, it is a great virtue to ignore it. Now, be honest. Have you ever had somebody to really do you wrong and you really wanted to get even with them? Let's go a step further. Do you find it easy to fly off the handle, to lose your temper? I've heard people say on many occasions, well, Pastor, I just had to give them a piece of my mind, to which I respond, you better stop giving away pieces of your mind. You need all you got. See, a short fuse person, a person who is always trying to get somebody else told, a person who cannot disagree with you without disliking you or discuss a hot subject without getting hot, that person has a discipline problem. Their temper is not discipline. If I have to punch something because people don't see things my way, something is wrong not with them, something is wrong with me. If I have to cuss people out because they don't agree with my point of view, I have an undisciplined mind, not an undisciplined tongue because the tongue can only say what the mind Hello, somebody. Uh, the issue is discipline. So let me ask you, how much does it take to tick you off? One little thing or any and everything. George Washington Carver said, I will never allow another man to control my life by ma making me hate him. When we say, you make me mad, 
What is it that we are admitting? Who's in control of us? Somebody else. They control my attitude. They control how I feel. They push the button. They pull the string. And when they do it, I react. When I am angry because of you, that means that you are controlling me. Isn't it amazing how little children learn that lesson at a very early age? I might be small. I may not be as powerful as you are. But if I can make my mama mad, if I can make my daddy cuss, guess who's in control? <laughs> See, a disciplined person restrains their reaction. 2 Timothy 4, 5 says, keep your head in all situations. He's saying that disciplined people work to act rather than react. So they're not controlled by circumstances. Proverbs 16, 32 says, it is better to be patient than to be powerful. It's better to have control of yourself than to control an entire city. And so if you want to be faithful, if you want to be successful, if you want to deepen your discipline, you got to master your moods, watch your words, restrain your reactions, but fourthly, I must stick to my schedule. Now, some of us have to first develop a schedule. Say amen, somebody. We're living accidentally rather than intentionally. You're not going to help me today, but I understand. Ephesians 5.15 says, live life with a due sense of responsibility. Make the best use of your time. We've all got about the same amount of time. We've got 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week, 168 hours in a week's time. Why is it that some people are more productive than the rest of us? Well, they're just lucky, Reverend. Well, they just got it like that. Well, they got it going on. No, not at all. Why is it that some people are able to get more done than the rest of us are with the same amount of time? You know what the key is? The key is personal discipline. Got the same amount of time, but they get more done because of personal discipline. They make a schedule, they stick to the schedule, they set it, and they abide by it. How well do you manage your time? If God were to take an accounting of you at the end of the week and say, look, brother, sister, tell me what you did with 168 hours that I gave you, how much of it could you account for? Look at the neighbor and say, you in big trouble, I can tell. See, three facts of life we've all got to face. Number one, to be a success at anything takes time. Number two, you don't have time for everything, so you got to be selective. And number three, if you don't decide how you are going to spend your time, other people will decide for you. Give me a better amen right there. So the fourth step is I've got to stick with my schedule with a due sense of responsibility. Number five, if I want to deepen my discipline, I must manage my money. Just smile at your neighbor and say, cash. And we all know that what Puff Daddy says is true. More money, more problems. Proverbs 21.20 in the Living Bible says the wise man saves for the future, but the fool spends all he gets. Ask your neighbor, say, how smart are you? <laughs> or for that matter, how smart am I? What's the point? You'll never know peace. You'll never know contentment. You'll never know prosperity living paycheck to paycheck. Discipline has to enter the equation at some point. Don't spend all you get. It's just that simple. Learn to live on the margin. The average American saves 4% of their income. The average European saves 16%. The average Japanese saves 25%. Why is it that we are so bad at this? How is it that they got so good? Well, the reason we are so bad at it is that most of us like to live now. Somebody say now. now. I got to have it now, even if I got to charge it. I'm going to live within my means, even if I have to put my means on my credit card. When the going gets tough, the tough goes shopping. 
See, recent statistics say that the average person is spending $1,300 for every $1,000 that they earn. Now, that's called deficit spending, and we can't help it. We're all Americans. That's what our government does, so we imitate the government. The only problem is that you ain't the government. See, and the government can do it and get away with it because they make the money. Hello, somebody. <laughs> Amen. And while we make some money, it's limited. Tell your neighbor, say, I know that's right. <laughs> because most of us get paid weekly, very weekly. Y'all get that on the way home. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Look, look. So you got to learn to manage your money. See, learning to manage your money is an issue of discipline. Impulse buying, the feeling that because I saw it, I've got to have it or I like it, so I got to buy it, is a lack of discipline. That's how we end up buying stuff that we don't need with money we don't have to impress folk we don't like and other people who really don't care. Just on the impulse. It looked good. It felt good. It looked right. They had one, so I thought I needed one. So let me ask you the question. How disciplined are you with your money? Have you learned to manage your money? Amen. Thank you for being honest. One brother over there said no. <laughs> See, contrary to what the beer commercial says, you cannot have it all, but you can enjoy what you have more. If you will discipline yourself to master your moods, watch your words, restrain your reactions, stick to your schedule, manage your money, and then there's a sixth step, I must maintain my health. Tell your neighbor, say, I don't think I'm going to shout off this sermon today. 1 <laughs> Thessalonians 4.4 4 says, each of you, that means you, each of you should learn to control his own body, keeping it pure and treating it with respect. There's not a single person in here to whom this next statement does not apply. All of our bodies need more exercise, more rest, and fewer calories. Now, I don't know which one of the three you fit into or whether you fit into all three, but everybody in here needs more rest, more exercise, and fewer calories. Smile at your neighbor and say, could you just leave me alone for the rest of this? Eight? <laughs> See, but in order to get there, it takes discipline. Proverbs 22, 23, verse 2 in the Good News Bible, listen to this. It says, if you have a big appetite, restrain yourself. Wait, that's the polite way of putting it, because in the New International Version of the Bible, it says, if you are given to gluttony, put a knife to your throat. <laughs> Let, let, let me give you the definition of a dieter. A dieter is someone who realizes that if they are not careful, what's on the table will end up on the seat. <laughs> y'all slow, amen. Some of y'all, yeah, it went right over. Hey, you'll get on the way home, amen. Look, take care of your body and your body will take care of you. Successful people are simply people who are willing to do things that unsuccessful people are unwilling to do. They work on developing personal discipline. So how do you begin to develop a plan of discipline in your life? You know what you do? Just like you found out that it needed to be a priority by going to the text, you look in the book. Tap your neighbor, say, look in the book. See, because not only do the scriptures point out the priority of personal discipline, but the text gives us a plan. Everybody say plan. plan. And remember, as one writer said, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Scripture gives us a plan, and the first step in plotting and practicing and planning a program of personal discipline is this. I've got to admit my lack of discipline. Admit it. Tap somebody, say admit it. Amen. Come on, wake them up. Say admit it. Amen. Amen. See, the reason some of us are asleep right now, we ain't got no discipline. <laughs> I know I'm telling the truth. Amen. I'm not trying to be offensive, just being honest. Ain't got no discipline. Amen. Amen. So we sleep at the wrong time. Instead of sleeping when we're supposed to sleep, hello, we go deep and we don't get no sleep because we be up all night to the... 
Ah, rock your world, baby. <laughs> Amen. Just admit it. Admit my lack of discipline. Don't deny it. Don't rationalize it. Quit making excuses. Don't, deno don't ignore it. Talk about, I don't have no problem. <laughs> Nothing wrong with me. You know, I, I got it together. I ain't got a temper. I don't have a drinking problem. I only drink when I get home. <laughs> I'm in good shape. I'm just a little out of breath. Stop denying it. Just admit my lack of this. I don't have a problem. I could break this habit anytime I want to. You know you lie. Why don't you break it then? Because you couldn't. Amen. Just admit it. Admit my lack of discipline. I used to say all the time, one of my favorite statements was, that is just not the way I am. Whenever anybody confronted me with anything that I didn't want to do, you know what I say? That's not the way I am. No, that ain't my flow, see? You got to get with my flow. I've been this way all my life. This, this is how I flow. Until I realized the Lord revealed to me in my devotional time, as I studied the word, as I prayed, as I was seeking ways in which to continue to grow, that it made no difference how I had always been. The only thing that mattered was what I wanted to become. And in order to become what I had not been, some changes had to be made. Because if I kept doing what I always did, I would continue to get what I'd always got. Help me somebody. See, I had to deepen my discipline. Even Paul, who was a tremendously disciplined person, struggled in this area. In Romans 7, 15, in the Good News Bible, Paul says, I do not understand what I do. For what I don't want to do, that I do. What I do want to do, that I can't do. Does that sound familiar? Can anybody here relate, relate to that? See, every, once, every one of us wants to be disciplined, but I believe we go about it the wrong way. Two things I've discovered in my life that do not work. Number one, willpower does not work. I'm going to try. There's a psychological principle that says what you resist persists. <laughs> the moment I start saying, I'm going to stop, I should, I must, or I to you are going to procrastinate about that very thing because there is a part of us you can call it the old man the old nature the carnal nature evil on the inside of me Sarah Sam Sue whatever your alter ego is named but there's a part of you and a part of me that is full of rebellion and says I don't want to do anything that I am not forced to do it's human nature willpower will not work what you resist will persist. We are attracted to the things that are no good for us. I'm sorry, I got to be the one to tell y'all. Last night, last night, I was sharing with the earlier congregation, last night, we were at a wonderful fellowship with a friend of ours and one of Rose's dear friends had baked a cake in fact, Rose's favorite cake. And uh, it was a, a lemon iced pound cake. And so Rose was saying to me, she said, honey, I said, what, what time are they going to start? She, uh, she said, 7 o'clock. She said, but we got to get there at 6. I said, well, we got to get there early. She said, well, we got to help her out, get set up and everything. So we go out to the car, and I notice that under Rose's arm is a Tupperware dish. Okay, I don't, I don't quite understand, but I'm going to just go with the flow. <laughs> so we go with the flow, we get there early. And uh, so she walked in, she saw the cake, you know, she had obviously told her that she was going to bake the cake. And uh, so Rose was like, well, you know, I, I don't want to subject anybody else to this. So I just put the cake in Tupperware and, you know, I take it home with me. So her, her husband also liked the cake, and he was like, no, 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 you can't take that cake home. And so what happened is Rose, you know, adopted a strategy. She's great on improvising in the moment. 
And so as, as each person came in, you know, she would be playing with, hey, how you doing? You know, good to see you. And she said, look, you don't want none of that pound cake. <laughs> she said, I try, it's kind of dry. Now, see, in addition to the pound cake, there was like this multi-layered, decorator design chocolate cake thing going on, sitting there looking all good, other kinds of desserts, all kinds of dinner, salmon and chicken. I mean, it was just laid out, right? And you know what happened? That one by one, everybody in that house, except one Mr. Goody Two Shoes, amen, you know, you always got one in the bunch. You, uh, uh, Everybody in that house made their way to the pound cake that was supposed to be dry. At the end of the evening, she was standing around with the Tupperware dish. And she said, honey, I don't understand what happened. I said, look, baby, it's in the Bible. I said, it's right in Genesis. I said, they went in the garden. God said, you need out of all them trees. Don't touch them too. And where did they go to eat? See, what you resist persists. Just saying, I I'm going to do better. I'm willing myself to do better. It's not going to work. Look, because it's human nature. We resist anything we feel we're being forced to. How many of you are still keeping resolutions from New Year's? How many of you can even remember what your resolutions was coming in? See, look, willpower does not work. Second thing is that looking for a one-time experience that's going to zap your life, change you, and all of a sudden make you prosperous and disciplined and focused and joyous and spirit-filled, that don't work either. That I spent years of my life suffering real defeat, looking for that one magical time that was going to change me and let me live in sinless perfection and absolute victory from that moment on. I can't tell you how many services I went to saying, oh yes, today I'm going to get that word. How many tapes I listened to saying, yes, it's on this tape. It's with Bishop Willie Wonder. It's with Mother Sanctified. If I get in the line and they anoint me with oil and I fall out and bang my head on the ground, that when I wake up, everything's going to be all right. My breakthrough is going to come when I let them knock me out, when I go over here where they're really spirit-filled, when I go over there where they're talking in tongues through the whole service, if I go over here and get a prophecy pronounced over me and they tell me everything I already know but didn't want to hear, hello, somebody, then my life will be totally different. And what God revealed to me is that what I needed was the very thing I was running from. It was not in one experience. What I needed was discipline. Can't no preacher give you a gift that ain't already in you. That's why you got folk who are preaching ain't been called to preach. Folk who's singing can't hit a note. Because somebody told him, oh, I see a singing anointing on you. No, you better bypass the middleman, go directly to God and say, Lord, what would you have me do? Amen. Amen. Sisters talking about, I know that's my husband. And he married to somebody else. I'm sorry, I didn't even mean to go there. Look, but what is really lacking is discipline. That was the problem. So I got to admit my lack of discipline. Secondly, I got to believe that God will help me. Just tap somebody and say, God will help you. Come on, tell them like you know, shake their hand. Say, God will help you. Yeah, yeah, look, because the Bible says, for it is God 
who works in you both to will and to do what pleases him. Know what that means? That God is working in you to give you the will and then to give you the power to do what God has created you to do. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. See, faith is very important in terms of learning self-discipline. Why? Because you've got to stop saying to yourself, I'll never be able to change. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing. So I keep repeating to myself, I'll never be able to change. you got to stop saying, that's just me. Faith comes by hearing. That's just the way I am. you got to stop saying that. You've got to expect that God is going to help you to be what you need to be. You must believe that you can change. Why? Because we act according to our beliefs. Our beliefs control our behavior. Our convictions control our conduct. The way I think determines the way I feel. The way I feel determines what I do. So instead of working on the symptoms, trying to feel different, trying to get in a service so I can feel different, work on your head so that you can think different. And when you think different, you'll feel different. And when you feel different, you'll do different. It, it, it starts in your head. But then step number three, claim a promise from the word of God. You know what you call that? Positive reinforcement. Eliminate the negative, put something positive in your mind. Instead of focusing on what you do not want, focus on what you do want. Hello. Stop saying if you're married, I, I, I don't want my husband, I don't want my wife to cheat on me. See, you focus on what you don't want. I, I, I don't want to be broke. See, when you focus on what you don't want, what you focus on, you move towards. <laughs> Y'all don't hear me. I don't want to be overweight. <laughs> well, I'm going to start next week. Mm -mm. You got to focus on what you want. Lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us, let us run with patience. Where? Looking unto Jesus. That's Hebrews, Hebrews 12. Look, looking unto Jesus. You've got to focus on what it is you want. I'll give you an example. There's a hot sweet potato pie sitting on the stove, and you're saying to yourself, I am not going to eat it all. I am not going to eat it all. I promise myself I am not going to eat it all. Matter of fact, like right now, um, I'm just going to eat a slice. Just one. <laughs> Focusing on the very thing. Look, look, just look at your neighbor and say, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> Amen. I, I'm not going to eat that whole half gallon ice cream. Just three scoops. I promise you. <laughs> I'm not, I, look, I, I just paid off my bills, just got my consolidation loan. I'm not going to charge these cards back up to the limit. <laughs> I do have a little space, and there is something I want. You are focusing on what you don't want. And as you focus on what you don't want, you move towards the very thing that you focus on. You've got to focus on the other side of the equation. Instead of worrying about whether your spouse is cheating, get your focus on, I want a wonderful relationship. Now, you know what that means? That now I'm going to begin to produce behaviors, actions, and feelings that will bring that relationship to me. Instead of focusing on poverty, and not wanting to be broke. I want to be able to pay all my bills without thinking about it and have a whole lot of money left over. So I produce the behaviors that bring that to my life. Instead of saying I don't want to be overweight, I say I want to be in shape. I want some ripples. I want a six pack. I want some biceps. I want to drop the tube around my middle. So you begin to develop behaviors that will bring that reality into your life. Taps Somebody say, focus on what you want. Am I talking to anybody up in this camp today? 
How do you do it? How do you do it? Look, you claim yourself a promise. Here's one, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Here's another, Isaiah 41.10, do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. 2 Timothy 1.7, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love, of power, and of a sound mind. The fruit of the spirit is self-control, self-discipline, not willpower, but it's the fruit of the spirit that as you allow God's spirit to saturate your life, the fruit it bears is the ability to control yourself. You ain't got to do nothing but yield to the spirit and the Spirit will give you the power to control yourself. Life control starts with thought control. Step number four, decide in advance. Proverbs 13, 15 says, a wise man thinks ahead, a fool doesn't. Ephesians 6, 13 says, so take up God's armor now that when the day comes, you'll be able to resist the enemy's attack. Why do you put, when do you put on the armor? When do you put on the armor? You put it on right now. You don't wait till you're in the battle. You put it on right now. So that when the enemy comes, you're already ready. You got to make a choice in advance of the time that you need it. Lately, I've been struggling with my exercise program. Yeah. Every day when I wake up, I got this battle going on in my head. And, uh, my mind or my body, one of them is talking. And I'll be hearing these thoughts like, you really don't want to get out this bed today. You really don't want to get on the treadmill today. Got a busy day. People going to be waiting on you. Got stuff to do. You got sermons to write, lessons to prepare, people to counsel. That's enough exercise. <laughs> and after all, you stayed up late last night. You aching a little. No, you ain't as young as you used to be. You're 40 now. But look, you know what my point is? That if I wait till the morning to decide whether I'm going to work out, I ain't working out. I'm rolling over. <laughs> See, don't ever argue with your feelings. Your feelings will always win. The way you master your moods, your feelings, is you decide in advance what you are going to do. Young people, don't wait till you get to the party and they roll in the joints and pass in the 40 ounces to decide if you're going to get high. Don't wait until you're in the back seat of a car or sitting on the bed in a hotel room to decide what your views of sex are. You got to decide in advance. Number five, enlist some support. Know what that means? You got to find people who can and will check up on you and encourage you and then make yourself accountable to them. That's hard. Amen? Bible says in Ecclesiastes 4, 9, two are better than one because if one falls down, the other can help him up. The scripture said, admonish one another, encourage one another, exhort one another. That is the value of a TLC group. It's not just a new program we created, but it is about existing, functioning, and growing in the context of a community of faith where I can become all that God intends for me to be. It's not just another distraction, but it is about having a support system where you can look at other people in the eye when you are really going through and say, hey guys, I know what the lesson is, but I need y'all to pray for me today. I need you to listen to me because I'm going through something and there'll be somebody there to look you right back in the eye, to put their arm around you, to hug you and to encourage you and to support you and to pray for you. Even the Lone Ranger needed Tonto so you know you and I need somebody. 
God meant for us to be in fellowship with those who can support us and nurture us and when we fall, lift us up. But we've got to enlist some support. You ain't going to make it very far trying to do it all by yourself. Find a friend in church and then ask them to encourage you, to pray for you. If they don't see you, to call and check up on you, to come by and see you. It will help you to deepen your level of discipline. I have people in this church who will walk right up out of the blue and ask me for no reason at all, Pastor, what you eat last week? You been to the gym? You been drinking your water? And y'all know what my first inclination is. <laughs> oh, none of your business. <laughs> I do's what I wants to do. <laughs> but I don't say that. You know why? Because I need their support. Knowing that somebody is watching what I do helps me to do what I'm supposed to do. I need them to ask me some questions and give me some support. But look, the final thing, step number six, if you're going to develop a plan of discipline in your life, is you focus on the reward. Look at somebody say, payday coming after a while. <laughs> Tell them again, say, payday coming after a while. <laughs> Hebrews 11, Moses is an example of making tough decisions, demonstrating discipline, choosing in advance. Focusing on the reward, Hebrews 11:24 says, "By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, discipline is connected to maturity. When he was grown up, he refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Circle refused. That's the negative. As he grew, as he matured, he made choices. Circumstances didn't dictate his behavior. He didn't follow the fickle fate of feelings. He chose. He refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. That's first. Verse 25, the same text says, he chose. That's on the positive side. He follows a negative with a positive. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God. Now, why would he do that when he was sitting on top of the world? The text says because he regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as greater value. He made a priority decision. It was greater value than all the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. Tell your neighbor, say, payday coming. Moses left all of that power, prosperity, pomp, and pleasure to join with a motley mob of slaves for a 40-year desert pilgrimage because he was able to look beyond the short term and know that in the long term, it would pay off big time. And just in case you were wondering, I want to tell you serving God will pay off. The pay might not be much, but the retirement plan is out of this world. <laughs> Payday's coming. See, and what, what discipline is about is delayed gratification. In everybody's life, you're going to have some pain. Say amen. amen. And hopefully you will have pleasure. Amen. You know what delayed gratification is? Delayed gratification is a choice to endure the pain first so that I can enjoy the pleasure later. Y'all need to wake up and write that down. I do the tough thing first so that I can enjoy the tremendous thing later. Get the pain out of the way so that I can enjoy the pleasure. I deny the lesser in order to gain the greater. It's the same principle that your parents tried to teach you growing up when they said, do your homework now. Then you can go out and play. Come on, somebody. Why, do, why don't we eat dessert first? because it'll spoil your appetite. You eat what you need first. Come on, somebody. Then you can enjoy the pleasure a little bit later on. Oh, I wish I had a witness up in here. You do the tough thing first to enjoy the benefit a little bit later on. This will work in your marriage. 
if you take the time to do the tough stuff first. See, the sex is the easy part. Y'all don't hear me. Figuring out how I'm gonna kiss you. Or what it take to woo you. That's the easy stuff. The tough stuff is communicating heart to heart, mind to mind. Discovering your attitude, your disposition, your funky ways, your hard to get along with days, how you look at night with rollers in your head, Noxema on your face, how you look when you got Mary Kay all over you, how you smell when you come in from working out, that's the tough stuff. How you spend your money, tough stuff. The state of your credit, tough stuff. Whether you're interested in partnership or domination, tough stuff. But if you get the tough stuff out the way, so that it is now heart to heart, mind to mind, two people, equal partners, looking in the same direction. Not one life interposed on another, but two lives walking together. Y'all don't hear me today. If you get past the tough stuff, it will pay off in the long haul. Do the tough thing first and focus on the reward. And what is the reward of having discipline in your life? Well, let's look at it. It's absolutely incredible. If you practice financial discipline, know what the reward is? You get good credit, have good cash flow, uh, amen. <laughs> you can pay your bills. <laughs> you ain't gotta be scared to answer the phone. <laughs> oh my, hello? May I speak to Mr. Watson? He ain't here. <laughs> I'm almost finished. Look, if you practice moral discipline, what's the benefit? You get a clear conscience, strong sense of self-esteem. You ain't got to worry about skeletons in the closet or live bodies coming back to visit and mess up your new situation. <laughs> You practice physical discipline, what's the benefit? You look better, you feel better, you have more energy, and on the average, you'll live longer. Practice spiritual discipline. What's the benefit? You have a hookup with the Holy Ghost, a direct line to Almighty God. You'll be saved by God, kept by God, blessed by God, led by God, lifted by God, supported by God. It's a great benefit. 